This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I am Gilad Halpern. And I'm Dahlia Shenlin. If you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. We're counting on you because, Dahlia, every little helps. Every week we bring you interviews with authors of books and research and other things that we find interesting. This episode is sponsored by the German government. Germany is now holding the EU presidency for the second half of 2020. And with its generous support, the Tel Aviv Review is holding this special series examining Israel's relationship with the EU, but also Israel's relationship with Germany, past and present. And today we'll be exploring how the past shapes our reality through literature. We haven't discussed fiction on this show for a while, so it's high time. And today we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Michal Ben-Naftali, who is both an academic and a literary author. She completed her PhD in contemporary French philosophy at Oxford. She teaches French literature and creative writing at Tel Aviv University and other places. She has translated major works of literature and philosophy into Hebrew. Uh, she's also an acclaimed author of essays, novellas, a memoir, and a novel. She received the Prime Minister's Prize in 2007, and she has been made a member of the French Order of Arts and Letters. Her 2016 novel, The Teacher, has won prizes in Israel and in Italy, and this is the book we'll be discussing today. It's been translated into English by Daniela Zamir, and I think it's your English language debut. Uh, Michal ben welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I want to start out with a line. I think we, we all think the translation is really beautiful. Uh, I th- there's a very interesting line uh, towards the beginning, and it says, the now that appears as once upon a time. And I want to ask you, whose now is this book about? Is it about an individual, the main character, the teacher? Is it about the narrator telling the story? Or is it a, a now in the experience of collective, the, the collective, the Israeli collective, uh, who we are now as a people? Well, I, I'll begin with the, um, with the negation of the last <laughs> option because... I, Process I of elimination. I, yes, I don't think that the novel is, is about collective sensibility. I mean, it engages uh, this story, of course. Uh, the teacher has to do with, a, with a, uh, as uh, Georges Perec used to say, uh, uh, history with a capital H. So there is a collective uh, sensibility which is engaged or involved in this story, of course, and perhaps we'll develop it uh, later on. But uh, it's a story about a character, a very, very specific and singular character. And so the whole uh, uh, effort, the whole uh, narrative effort, the whole uh, effort that I took to, to write it was um, in order to to understand, to perceive, uh, and to see also the um, limits of my comprehension as a narrator. So perhaps the drama is between the narrator and the and the main character. That is exactly what yeah. I think comes out of yeah. the novel. But yeah. who is this protagonist? Mm. Is It's a she. Is she a composite? Mm. Is she based on a real life, a historical figure? Is she fact? Is she fiction? Mm. It's both. I mean... It's. I'll tell in a few words for for the audience who do not uh, did not uh, read the story. Yeah, uh, it's about yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's about um, a sixty five year old teacher, English teacher in a high school in Tel Aviv, in the midst of Tel Aviv, who commits suicide uh, in nineteen eighty two uh, by jumping out of her balcony, and thirty years afterwards. Uh, uh, the narrator, who is a former student of her and who becomes a teacher uh, herself, uh, is uh, overwhelmed all of a sudden by the memory of this woman who is uh, called Elsa Weiss in the story. So, yes, indeed, it is based on, on uh, factual um, material, but uh, processed by the, the way we process things in, in the laboratory of literature. So it's not, it's not the real name. And it's uh, and also the narrator says something about the mixture, about the transformation between uh, facts, factual f- uh, history and, and invention and, and, um, and fiction. It's interesting because I, you know, I, I feel like I'm 
know that woman, if not <laughs> her specifically, but you know what she stands for, for many reasons. I think mm-hmm. because you're uh, not uh, you do, you not do not belong to my generation. Yeah, so maybe you're younger. So. Yeah, maybe, uh. maybe. But 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 also she she reminded me a lot of my grandmother, and then okay. boy was I amazed mm-hmm. to see that they even come from the same town in Romania. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It used to be uh, Hungary. The, yeah, yeah so exactly. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, oh, extraordinary. So wow. my, my, my paternal grandparents uh, came from Kolozsvár, oh, wow. today Cluj in Romania, yes, 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 yes. and they were Hungarian-speaking, uh, grew up in a Hungarian-speaking household mm-hmm. in what later uh, became Romania. I have plenty of stories about that. I mean, not to steal your thunder, wow, but I have actually <laughs> been in Cluj. Seriously? <laughs> I have. I've oh, never yes. been. I, 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 me neither. Yeah. yeah. It's very and pretty, anyway, yeah. But, but what I'm saying is <laughs> yeah. that you said, you know, you, you were quick to rule out Dali's mm-hmm. suggestion that it's perhaps, you know, a collective portrait of some mm-hmm, sort. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it feels to me like, you know, I've Excellent. met this woman, mm. not just my grandmother, but People mm-hmm. like her mm-hmm. so many times. Not so much anymore because they've all died out. But, you know, 20 years ago, they were all over the place. Mm. I'll tell you something. I think it's a very, very interesting remark. I think that they, it, it's, it's a teacher. Yes, and the, the fact or the the, um, and the the element, this dimension of to be a teacher, this was my first trigger to the whole story. Before starting with the, the Kastner's trial and everything, the Holocaust, etc., etc., et teaching. Teaching when you are in elementary school, when teaching is something that becomes such a you know a second nature, so to speak, that uh, you could or you might forget that there was ever a person, a real person, a singular person to have transmitted this knowledge. I mean, and and I think that this mechanism of self-effacement, this is uh, relating to your what you say that it's everybody, it's not mm-hmm, a real, mm-hmm. but this uh, mechanism of self-effacement is even more intense and more uh, uh, precise in the generation that I was uh, that I was dealing with. That is to say, uh, the 70s, when um, the teachers used to be totally identified with their professional personality. There was no intimacy whatsoever. And so it is true that you meet a type. It's not only, I think that there is something which is really an irreducible singularity here, but at the same time, it's a type. And it's a type also connected with the relationship of the Israeli society towards Holocaust uh, survivors, etc. So there are, of course, levels that are connected with the communal or, or the collective, collective experience, which is why I think it is. Maybe maybe it was yes, inadvertent, sure. but I do think there's a lot to I be agree. said here about what it means. And it's interesting because yeah. you say that the teaching was the starting point, and that was yeah. actually one of the last questions we had, but I'm going to bump it up to the front. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I wanted to ask, what was the significance of the fact that you chose to write a book about a teacher? You could have written about many people. I'm sure you've met and experience lots of interesting people in your life. But it mm. does seem that there's a running thread. Teaching is what keeps her alive in yeah. various yeah. ways mm-hmm. in, in the experience of the narrator, but also while she's in a concentration camp. And yeah. tell us what you think the symbolism of the teaching activity is. Or maybe it's not a symbol. Maybe it's a reality that it that it really keeps people emotionally connected to something. I'll tell you, perhaps it's not the whole answer to this, but uh, I, I mean, a, a book before... Uh, it was a, a memoir that I wrote about my grandmother. It is called The Spirit. And then I related to a very, very certain experience, which is also, I don't think that it was much talked about even now in the Israeli society. That is to say, people who came to Palestine during the 30s, the beginning of the 30s, 34, etc., etc., and then to realize after the war that everybody's gone, the whole family is gone. And we do not have the right terminology for this. What are they? Are they survival? Are they, you know, it's it's very, very complicated. And the effect of having no name is something that bothered me at the time. And I can elaborate it, but I'll put it aside. Uh, I dealt with my grandmother, okay, and then I am considered to be, so to speak, third generation. So it was something within the family that I try to understand because everything was silent. It's a, it's a hole, a hole that the whole H-O-L-E that mm-hmm. the, nobody speaks about and how a, a familial sensibility is created um, around this hole. And uh, and this is a, to come to back to, to your question about teaching. When you go, and I say it in the, in the, in the book, uh, the expectation, the familial expectations from a high school or a school are that it would be an extension of what is happening in one's home. But then you go to school 
and you meet something which is not exactly what you expected it to be. And so what I was interested to in uh, teaching is, is where you go. It's perhaps the, 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 the immediate or experience that one have, I mean, used to have, because now we can be at home and in the whole world at the same time. But in my generation, it was not possible. And so you could go outside and then you have a world, a world of its own. And so this was my, also, because there are many dimensions to this question, but uh, teaching was, and, and then to, to tell something from a third generational viewpoint, that is to say something in which I was not implicated as a, as a, in a genealogical manner, but something which I met and which was crucial to my understanding, to my sensibility, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, one of the... So, so is it because of her central role in so many people's lives, because she was a mediator for so many people to the outside world in a sense, and therefore, you know, the baggage that she comes with hmm. perhaps implicated the whole situation? I would say that it is very implicit, you know, because what she said, and I, I just to describe it once more, uh, she was an English teacher. She was not supposed to be an English teacher. She could have been a French teacher. So she did not teach her the language that she used or was uh, prepared to, 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 to teach, so to speak. It was English, thereby creating very saturated conversations. I mean, she asked questions that had the right answers, etc., etc. Everything was very saturated and very, you know, very simple to that extent, using English, which is an empirical, factual language, and there was no dimension of affect or sensibility or emotion, etc., etc. So, and um, so I don't think that meeting her was directly Uh, that she was the transmitter of this kind of knowledge, but there was something in her personality, the contradictions that uh, uh, characterize her personality, that is to say being at the same time could be compassionate and very tender and, and, um, and just, but at the same time cruel sometimes to, to I mean, the, 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 the fact that the author, the, the narrator comes back to the story, the fact that uh, she was at the same time terrorizing her, students, while the students understand, even unconsciously or subconsciously, they do understand that she's being terrorized herself. Yeah. And interestingly enough, many people recognize that, although she's Elsa Weiss, and they recognize that they, because she was really a personality that nobody who passed through, and, and also the, the name of the school is not mentioned, but everybody could really understand who Uh, who is the, the personality? That, that, that Quite interesting because yeah. I, I'm very curious to go back to that moment when 30 years later when the narrator yeah. suddenly decides that, you know, she's struck by memories and has to write about this. And I feel like there is, as you mentioned earlier, sort of a tension between the narrator and the protagonist, uh, a tension, uh, a bond of some sort. I think mm -hmm. the narrator is hugely influenced but also personally feels some, some, some sort of connection. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I even wondered if both of those yeah characters may be considered parts of a personality of even the same person. Hmm, it's a very, very beautiful uh, suggestion. I would say there is a sort of a mise en abîme, but when you use it in French, you used to say mise en abîme, that is to say a story within a story, but literally mise en abîme, uh, uh, it wants to say uh, putting, mettre en abîme, in the abyss. So in a sense, I could say that the narrator puts herself in the abyss of Elder Weiss in order to, to write, to understand, uh, but not understand, even to understand is something very comprehensive, but there, there are limits to this understanding. But yes, there is a bonding with no dialogue because dialogue with this figure is not possible at all. So it's a woman who resists a dialogue. It's like a wall. It's like a Bartleby. You know, it's like, a, I prefer not to. There is something of this uh, neg negativity in this character, but there is a very, very strong uh, attempt at um, a, 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 um Perhaps empathy is the right word, but I, I, I because because it's not a it's not a identification because it's something that resists also identification. But it, I, 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 and I agree totally with you. I think that this is really the drama between the the two characters that one tries to put herself uh, in in another. I, I will tell it also in I will say it also differently. I mean, it's a, a friend of mine who just died a month ago. And her name is Nama Atzal. Uh, perhaps you read it. Uh, yes, I'm saying a month ago, but uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and, and she wrote uh, a very, very interesting book, um, 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 reflexive book, uh, not fiction, about uh, 
Israeli author, which I admire, whom I admire. His name is Yoshua uh, Knaz. He belongs in the generation of Amos Oz and uh, Alubet Yoshua, etc. So they're not well known as they do. And he in Israel, maybe he's just as well known? Yes, yes, of course. Maybe not as course. much abroad. Uh, yes, although he was translated into French, but in other uh, languages as well, he's a remarkable author that uh, made different uh, poetical decisions while uh, writing his novels. And uh, Naamat Sal uh, called the, 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 the book that she wrote, uh, she called it Hem uh, Dibrubil Shonab, they spoke their languages. And what she says, this is part of her argument, that um, uh, when uh, Yoshua or Oz write the novels at the beginning of the 70s, for example, etc., etc., they always represent the character. That is to say, when Yeshua writes uh, The Lover, so he can speak like an Arab like an Arab uh, person can speak. When Amos Oz writes a, a, a black box, he speaks like a Mizrahi Jew, et cetera, et cetera. So they or a devour woman. a woman. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, there, there was no uh, constraint whatsoever in, in terms of representation. And while uh, um, Joshua Knaz, when he hears, for example, as the narrator, he hears uh, Hungarian, we are not sure. Hungarian, or is it Polish, or is it German, or... And he says they spoke the languages, and the narrator is beside the character, he listens, and he cannot understand, he cannot comprehend the language of... And, and I was speaking with, I was speaking with Nama and consulting uh, while, while, while I was writing this novel, and I was wondering how could I put myself uh, uh, par rapport, you know, in relation to the figure, and then I realized that this kind of relationship, that is to say, let her speak her language. I can understand. I can sometimes repeat. I can describe the way she speaks. And there are many chains of, of uh, essay attempts at describing the way she speaks. Including her own changes in how she speaks. I remember the scene where she learns how to curse when she's in kindergarten. <laughs> yes, she's a- in another language, in Romanian, yeah. and she, yeah. she is shocked by herself because yeah. she doesn't realize the power of the words. Yeah, yeah. This is, she's really very, um, um, from, from childhood, she's really very, um, you know, she, she, she questions the, the power of language, the, the performative power of language from, from the very beginning. Yeah. And, and of the, course, how does it relate to the, um, you know, underlying theme in the book, which is, yeah. of course, the Holocaust and yeah. the yeah. indescribability of uh, the events. I mean, there's a whole issue mm-hmm. of the language mm-hmm. yeah. around it. I would say, no, because, okay, yes, of course. I mean, from the fifth, uh, from the uh, 50s onwards, uh, Adorno and then Lyotard and uh, uh, what Lanzmann did with the uh, Hashoah, etc., etc., there were always the, what we called after Shaul Friedlander's book, the limits of representation, pro- probing the limits of representation, etc., etc. So there is no need for me, I think, to add something in this, because the, the problematizing the language of how we speak and could we speak, this whole sensibility that I grew, this was my intellectual climate when I went to Oxford, well, it was in the, during the, ni- the beginning of the 90s, this was the, you know, this was, a, a Lanzmann said, and it was quite an imperative, I mean, we could, he did, he made his film with no use whatsoever of documentary. Uh, um, uh, he he uh, interviewed, he did not make simultaneous uh, translation because he wanted us to hear a, each and every language. And this is how, because it became so long, nine hours that you sit and you, and because the, uh, um, doing once again, taking the language from the victim or from the survivor once again means dehumanizing once again and you, you, you cannot do it. So this was a, a, not only an epistemological or a cognitive constraint, it was also a moral constraint. And I grew in this atmosphere. And of course, I wrote this, uh, this, this text in 2015 and we are not in the same, in the same condition anymore because there are, there are few survivors left. And, and, and it is really, it is concrete. I mean, and, and I think that we have to rethink the whole issue of how to bear witness to the witness. It's not only an impossibility, as Celan used to say, no one bears witness to the witness. Bearing witness to the witness is perhaps a must and perhaps literature has to engage with it. So I don't think, to repeat, to, to come back to your question, I don't think that the, the novelty, so to speak, of, the, of this book is the... the or, all the limits of a person. Of course, it's the limit of a person. There are many, there, there is a part of the... No, I didn't ask, uh, you know, uh, what, what's a novelty, but okay. so much, you know, to, to, for you to describe your experience in writing it I and mean, going about that question yeah. or of dealing yeah. with this yeah. hot potato. Yeah, yeah, yes, of course, of course. And, 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 and above all, a woman who said no to everything, who negated every 
possibility of negotiating with her. So how could I write and also be very punctuate about her negativity? Because she says no to everything. To Palestine, she says no. To Zionism, she says no. To family, she says no. To she sex, even tries to, to say to no. Children, to, yeah. Yeah, she even, okay. Well, I, I was just thinking that she even tries to say no to escaping. Yeah, the exactly, camp. exactly. To what life. does that mean? She says no well, to life. That, yeah, at the end she says no to life. But yeah, no, only, the, this is very interesting, okay? Because one of the questions that I, I ask myself is how come there are survivors who tried with all the problematics that we know about, because the second generation literature we know, and uh, David Grossman and Savion Librecht and uh, Nava Semel, etc., etc., so we know Michal Govrin, all the people who wrote about it, uh, living in the shadow of parents who came from, from, from the Shoah, etc., etc. So, uh, um, but they tried to create a family after the Holocaust. But what about people like Elsa Weiss, who came to Palestine and was not capable, did not want or could not. Why? Why there are people who were capable or thought that they were capable of uh, uh, reconstituting a continuity while there were others who could not do it? This was one of the questions that I posed to myself. And then for me, there was a depressive kernel there that waited, that was already before the war. And that the war augmented or intensified, but there was something in her that you know took her... And these are kind of uh, characters that always interest me. I mean, these is, are... is there some subversive element in that, in the way that you're, in a way, protesting against the, you know, paradigmatic narrative of rebuilding after mm. the Holocaust? Yeah. She didn't want to rebuild. She, she didn't <laughs> yeah. even want to live. Right, Israel was the redemption. We're supposed yeah. to have lots of children and yeah, repopulate yeah. the Jewish people after hmm. the Holocaust. Well, yeah, some of us. And, and also, you know, be, be alive and merry and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't, You know, um, um, put these words in order to describe my own stance or position, but uh, I thank you because I think that there is something rebellious. Uh, I, I'll tell you, I, in, in my own words, I would say that the always, always, in all my books, uh, both fiction and non-fiction or half-fiction or semi-fiction or whatever, the women, I, my eyes are, you know, the, my eyes uh, catch, are women who are at the same time part of this, what you describe as familial, familiar, sensibility, a normal Israeli, um, a normative Israeli collective life, yes, in, in which family constitutes one of the major, major uh, uh, horizons, uh, hopes, everything is, is, is there, uh, um, um, encapsulated in this, uh, uh, in this familial uh, um, project. And at the same time, at the same time, also in, in uh, spirit, when I wrote about my grandmother, which was, uh, and, and she was there, she constituted, she formed the family, but on the other hand, on the other hand there is withdrawal, there is retreat. There is certain uh, manifestation, different manifestations of saying no. In my grandmother's uh, case, it was the ulcer. She developed an ulcer. I mean, it was really somatic illness. In the case of the teacher, there was nothing about somatization. It was not somatic. But there, in, in her... The, the paranoid, the, the, the blame the, that she took upon herself, the guilt she took upon herself was something that she, she carried to the moment that it was not possible to continue anymore. But yeah, It's interesting that you say it wasn't somatic in terms of she was a healthy character, right? Yeah. But but I, without wanting to give too many spoilers, it seems yeah. like she does, there is something that happens later in the book that m maybe it wasn't like she did it purposely, but I now that you're saying it makes me think that there is sort of a, a second destruction in her life later on in Tel Aviv. Yeah, um, yeah. And you don't, you don't write it as if she did it on purpose. Hmm. But now that you mention this idea... Of, wow, it's the first time that I hear it. Wonderful, wonderful interpretation. Should we, should no, we no, tell no, the... It, everything is spoiler because we know that she's <laughs> dead from the beginning. <laughs> well, that's so. in the beginning, right. <laughs> well, there is an, a, a, a yeah, sort yeah, of destruction well, in her life that happens yeah, yeah. after she's living Very in Tel Aviv. Very interesting. I mean, I never, never th I, um, thought about it as something that was purposeful. Yeah, well... I want to ask you also about the significance of suicide. I mean, yeah. this is, you say, you're, you know, mm. you're, you're, your attention is always caught by women who are a little bit depressive or something. Well, <laughs> I, I, I have yeah. to say, I'm just going to be honest, I find the topic of suicide interesting, and especially in the context of Holocaust survivors. Yeah. We have yeah. two yeah. other authors I could think of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yezhi Kozinski, Primo Levi, we think is suicide. So, uh, Paul Celan, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so what do, you, what do you think about that? Is it a phenomenon or is it just a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. 
I don't know, it's very, very difficult. And each case is really different and singular. And it's, but I think that they, it's um, when I think about elder vice, yeah, I think that it has to do with guilt, with, because survival is guilt. It's always guilt is involved when we are. When when we live after, when we live after, when we are supposed uh, we, we supposed to have died and and we didn't, so there was, and and um, I think that in in all the cases that you mentioned, there is an inevitability, there is a necessity to it. Um, um, I think that there is a, I, I I I I put the word I, I I use the word depression, but perhaps melancholy would be more. More precise, because when Freud, for example, but this is an example, I mean, what, I, what, what he says about melancholy, the, the inability, the incapacity to work through mourning, to put an end or a completion to working through mourning, is, is the, that you become um, a living dead because you devour the, the dead. And I think that we know we, we recognize this when I when I spoke earlier on about also yeah this is it's 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 here it's in the stomach you know, the dead are in the stomach and 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 then the dead become living dead themselves there is this kind of very intimate constitutive relationship because it's not only that <clears throat> the world has gone um, uh, empty or <clears throat> or poor without the the beloved one it's only it's also me myself who, and and we know this melancholy we know it not only from the holocaust context of course but i think that this the the unnaturality of the of this whole um inconceivable tragedy um uh, made the the melancholic reaction become more more um necessary in in a sense so i can understand i can really deeply understand this melancholic with the meaning to put an end to your life because you're already always already dead in a sense and you could uh, I, i can i can understand it I but, can, but well, of course it's also very central to the story yeah, of uh, yeah. elsa weiss yeah. because well just you know by virtue of this structure of the book yeah, and then it yeah. opens with her yeah, yeah. with her suicide it, yeah, it is yeah. really in a, in many ways a, a d- defining event in her life it sounds stupid but I, I guess you know what I mean her death is a her defining de- yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, yes I think that she because the question would be perhaps um, how come she could live after because she 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 is always uh, uh, the daughter of her parents I mean we are always you know the daughter the sons of our parents but uh, I think that the focus changes throughout life and uh, being uh, she, she was married but then she divorced that whatever it's not a, it's really it's not it's not the, the phenomenon the, the major event of her life of course and and then uh, and, and she stays and, and and she does it because we didn't speak about Kasna yet but uh, uh, she, she got it this gift of life for the second time from her father. Because he gave her the chance to regain her life or to to stay alive and she she she's um tied to this to this um to this gift once more because it big her life begins with the gift of life of her parents and then the second time and then uh, there is an end and, and she couldn't bear it no longer so. yeah it's quite interesting that uh the uh-huh. scenes with her with her parents yeah. are really the only scenes in the book where she has a joyful side of her uh, personality yes, 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 yeah. I don't know if that was on purpose but then there's of course Kastner and we've referred to him yeah. many times it's mm-hmm. a critical part of the book but in a way mm-hmm. you know uh when Kastner is murdered of course after yeah. the trial she 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 breaks down on some level and it's almost like he was a father of her rebirth because yeah, yeah. He was, mm. she was saved by him yeah, tell us about the yeah. Kastner theme in your story well this is also connected with the <laughs> history with capital H so to speak uh, it, it is it's happening in Hungary it's uh, uh, the last part of the war uh, when the Nazi invade uh, Hungary and then there is what we know as the Judenrat which uh, not only in Hungary but in other places as well that is to say uh, Jews that belong to the to the Jewish um, Hanhaga, uh, how do we say? Hanhaga, leadership. Leadership, leadership yeah. and, and then they were involved in different kinds of negotiation with the Nazis, which, uh, which is a major topic that became also very controversial after the war, not only in Hungary, but in other places as well. And there is a the negotiation with Kastner, who is uh, one of the leaders, with the Eichmann and others as well, uh, in order to prepare a train, 
by buying it with money uh, to prepare a train that would uh, include uh, 1,684 Jews from different sectors of the Jewish uh, population. That is to say also refugees from Slovakia and Czech, Czech, from, from Poland and and uh, from the country and from uh, Budapest, etc., etc. Uh, Orthodox Jews like the Satma who went then to, to America and, and, and Zionists, etc., etc. Each sector uh, to create a sort of um, melange of um, different... Um, in order to save them, and it was supposedly to go, this train would, uh, should have gone to uh, via uh, Portugal to Palestine, but the plan did not work uh, as, as it was supposed to have worked. And then they, they went to, to Bergen-Belsen. They were a few months in Bergen-Belsen, then they were in Co in Swiss as a refugee camp. And then some of them, not all of them, came to Palestine. And we, we know the story. And I, also, I, I will tell you one thing which is really crucial. I think that not only uh, many of the audiences, I'm sure that uh, I suppose that they don't, do not know this story, because after the war, when the Knesset legislated what we call the, the law of uh, doing justice with the Nazis and their helpers, nobody thought of uh, catching Eichmann at the time. Eichmann was really, the, it, was, it was a moment, yeah, because beforehand there were Jews who were walking like this on the street and seeing the capo in their camp. And after the legislation of the Knesset, these were Jews persecuting Jews. And this was, and this is what is called uh, afterwards the capo, the capo trials. It's a very, very tragic and, and. And there's a wonderful recent book about it that mm-hmm. was featured on the Tel Aviv Review a few months ago. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, there was also a very, very interesting uh, uh, book. I think it was one of the first that dealt with it of uh, uh, Edith Zotal, uh, oh, yeah. the, the nation and and, right. and the dead, uh, um, the, the nation and, and death. Uh, and then, uh, and she was yeah. and also quoted, quoted from the and, and uh, uh, Landau, the judge who stood for was the, in, in in Eichmann's trial, was one of the of, of the judges in in, in this, the couple trials, and and he said uh, what we said a few moments ago that one cannot either describe or, or judge being in this condition, and and this is the context where. Kastner is brought into trial by because there is a, a really um, a poor guy, an elderly person who is called Malkiel Greenwald, and who writes about him. Kastner is uh, in, in Mapai, in the labor movement. He's quite a notable person, also in Israel. And and he writes uh, about what happened. And uh, and, and then there was, uh, something, because, because Malkiel Greenwald is represented by uh, Shmuel Tamir, who is a very, very uh, ambitious uh, lawyer from the revisionist part, on the right wing of, uh, of uh, the Israeli um, uh, uh, um, political uh, spectrum. arena, yeah, spectrum, and and then uh, and uh, Judge Halevi, who is sitting there in this, the first trial, because there were two trials, and after his murder, there was uh, the, the one that exonerated him, and Halevi, w- w- you know, and, and, and this is some of the thing that uh, Elza Weiss is really struck uh, by, by this saying that that he Kastner sold his his soul to the devil. And so, and, and I think that uh, even now, this is something that is really very, very controversial. I, I don't want to say that my story is in, in the justice, so to speak. I'm really trying to to describe from my very uh, singular character, with all the empathy that I can, to, to, to bring out this... this uh, and I would like to ask you something yeah. completely yeah. different. Yeah. Well, not completely, but yeah. you know, something yeah. that is really not about the story per se, but about mm-hmm. the writing mm-hmm. process. Yeah. Because you are an academic also, specializing no, in... No, not, not exactly, no, because no, I'm in mean, what we call the uh, Amartza No, but still, no maybe yeah. not in yeah. terms of your labor, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. your employment, uh, but, you know, you, 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 are, you have written mm-hmm. academically and done quite a bit of research in uh, issues pertaining to modern philosophy and literary theory. Does any of that inform your literary writing? <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Does okay. all of that inform your <laughs> literary writing? <laughs> you know, I, I would say this. Um, um, every, every, everything creates or constitutes my, my sensibility. I would say that the, my major influence throughout many years have been, and I also translated him, is Jacques Derrida. Now, to say Jacques Derrida, when people don't, didn't didn't read it is I, I think that people come go ag- immediately to to, uh, to it's very very complex it's formal it doesn't have any existential dimensions whatsoever it is uh, incomprehensible etc et for me it is existentialism 
by itself, you know, all the questions of uh, forgiveness and hospitality and then sacrifice and then gift and et cetera, et cetera. These are the issues that Derrida uh, considered. And I would say that, um, um, yes, indeed, I, I think that um, one of the things that bothered me uh, intellectually, and it's also, it also has to do with our contemporary actual day-to-day -day life, uh, is the question of collaboration. This is a huge question because this is, this is a story of Kastner. He, as if, so to speak, collaborated while negotiating with the Nazi. That is to say, collaborating with, uh, uh, being in contact with the enemy. It's not like collabo français. It's, it's different, but, but the, 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 the theme of collaboration troubled me. Are we, when we negotiate with our enemies, are we not engaged in a sort of collaboration? And I think that the, um, one of the things that uh, bothered me also intellectually is the, the question of the, our capacity to transcend and to overcome sometimes our purest, purest intuitions. Mm. Yeah? Especially uh, at a time of deep political division that often feels like it's quite yeah, life or death and yeah, actually is quite life or exactly, death. Exactly. Uh, left wing uh, here in Israel nowadays, I mean, we, uh, sometimes we are very connected to the integrity of one's own self-identity in which the contours of you cannot, uh, but perhaps sometimes negotiating that is to say being in contact, speaking, not exactly, not necessarily creating a coalition, okay, but the possibility of contamination. And this is a, quite a deridian. What, what we call the construction, God forbid, this is the, the, the contamination, the possibility of one opposite invading the other, constituting, making possible the other, et cetera, et cetera. This is really the major. So if you ask me, of course, everything is, is in it, all my love for literature and for words and for composition and what I learned and what I thought. And there is a... Um, um, the, the, and I'm engaged with 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 ideas. I mean, I wouldn't have written had I don't had I not wanted to 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 express my ideas, my my thoughts, my hesitations, my questions. I mean, this is and 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 because of it, so everything is connected to everything. And and, and literary was the outlet that really lent itself to it. I think that throughout it, also you said that I wrote um, it all, 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 I, I was always uh, traveling or wandering from one genre to another. I was never self-sufficiently, so I always contaminated genres. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's not something. Genres like, that collaborate with one another. <laughs> with, exactly. But I, I mean, I, yeah, I do think that um, one of the strengths of the book is yeah. that you are asking a lot more questions than you yeah. are purporting to answer, which yeah. Yeah. sometimes is not the case in uh, discourse about ideas. Yeah, yes. So if that was your yeah. intention, I think you did it very well. Um, I, I just uh, one, one last question about yeah. the English translation okay. that's recently come out. Yeah. I mean, how did you, were you involved in the work? on how? Because in a way, I, I read the, the Hebrew original yeah. and it felt like the kind of Hebrew that you use is, the language is pretty, it's very skinny in a way, very matter of fact. Very which, not Derrida, thank you. Very not, yeah. <laughs> no offense, God. no offense yeah. to Derrida. No, but, but it, it's, it's, it's just like very... Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, Staring. yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, not not mm -hmm. flowery in in any way that I think is also you know mm -hmm. of course says mm -hmm. a lot about the 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 the, the plot and the story itself, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's also a style that really uh, fits Hebrew very well, which is itself a sort of a matter of fact language. How about um, the adaptation to to English? Did any of that transpire? Well, first of all, I disagree. I, I, don't, I, don't I was going to say I disagree too, so I'm happy that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, 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 the Hebrew language has much more um, speculative part, uh, which is, make, it becomes more, for me, uh, resembles the French than the English. I think that the matter of factness is very English. Very English. Yeah. And what Daniela did, in my uh, view, was really to, to, because I have many very long phrases that she cut. And uh, this, uh, I think that the obligation towards uh, empiricism and factuality was really hers. But you're right to have said that, uh, remarked that um, it's very austere because of the character. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's very disciplined. But it's also, it, it, I think it's fascinating because yeah. it is austere, but it also, for that, maybe for that reason, opens up 
I think, a great space, which is mm-hmm. kind of a void, but it's a void that you, you know, the mind, I'm constantly, as a reader, you're constantly trying to fill it with like, what is going on here? What is happening? How do I answer these questions? I think that the fact that the language is spare leaves a lot of room for thinking while mm-hmm. reading. That was my experience. Thank you. <laughs> and on this awesome. note that I uh, completely uh, agree with, I mean, uh-huh. uh, you should all buy the book and read it. <laughs> Not ASAP. that we're advertising or anything. No, no, of course not. <laughs> Uh, Michal van Aftali, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for this hospitality. Yeah. And many thanks to Itai Shalem, our sound engineer and producer, and again to the German government for sponsoring this series on Israel's relationship with the EU and European countries, and of course Germany and uh, its history. And now we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app and would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review of any kind, of any genre. <laughs> uh, you too can support us by going to our website, that's tlv1.fm slash review and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has, I think, already 600 interviews or so, uh, just ready for you to download. And if you like what we do here, you can also like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast Ideas from Israel. And please, please, please do not forget to follow Dahlia and me on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from me and from Dahlia, goodbye. goodbye.